today in John chapter four, what we'll see is that Jesus is dealing with a worship issue with this woman at the well as well. Here's the reality, guys. All of us worship something. All of us worship something, and we generally fashion ourselves in the image of that which we worship. There's a great book. I'm going to show you a, uh, a segment from it called We Become What We Worship. Is that on the screen? Maybe not. Yep. Yeah, well, it's technically not upside down. The golden calf is. There's a right side up golden calf right there. Yeah. Because worship that is idolatrous is upside down. See what he did there? Nice. All right. Guy named uh, G.K. Bill, and here's what he writes in this book, We Become What We Worship. Let's see if I can do this better. Sorry, I'm still learning. I know Mark is an expert at this. Okay. Got that? All right. I'm going to start right here. What do you and I reflect? One presupposition of this book is that God has made humans to reflect him. But they do not commit themselves to him. They will not reflect him, but something else in creation. At the core of our beings, we are imaging creatures. It is not possible to be neutral on this issue. We either reflect the creator or something in creation. And later on, he writes this right here. What people revere, they resemble, either for ruin or restoration. All of us in here worship something. And the reality is that whatever it is that we worship, we tend to fashion ourselves in the image of. If we worship a certain body image or a body type, we'll do a lot of stuff in order to achieve that. We'll buy specialty drinks. We'll become part of health clubs, meal clubs. We'll work out. We'll get up really early in the morning at 530, 5 o'clock. How many of you get up 5 o'clock, 530 in the morning? Some people get up that not because they have to. They get up because they want to go work out, right, because they want to be healthy. Um, people get up to go do incredible, to keep their body in shape. And that's not always a bad thing because we need to be healthy people. But sometimes it's motivated because we have this image of what we think we should look like. And as a result, we sacrifice a great deal to make ourselves in that image. If we worship a certain status, for instance, if we want to be wealthy, we'll sacrifice a great deal in order to become wealthy. Maybe our family time, maybe... uh, the expense of the church. We'll hold on to money as we saw earlier today because we want that money for ourselves because we want the status that comes with the money. If we worship that status, we'll try to craft ourselves into the image of that status. Here's something for us to consider as members of the church. What happens if you worship a pastor or a teacher? You could jump into a 1 Corinthians problem and you could begin fashioning yourselves in the image of a Apollos or Peter, or Paul, instead of the image of Jesus. I remember whenever I was beginning to preach, one of my heroes in preaching is a guy named John Piper. Many of you are familiar with him. And I would try to emulate him when I was preaching because I valued his preaching. In some ways, I probably valued it too much. And instead of allowing God to formulate me and to the preacher he was calling me to be, I tried to formulate myself in the image of John Piper. I'm not supposed to do that. John Piper is not the one who saved me. I'm supposed to formulate myself into the image of Jesus, right? And the danger is, thank you, Miss Carolyn, the danger is if, if we begin to worship someone like Mark Lanier too much, even though as great as he is, we're fashioning ourselves after the wrong person. Because what happens if Mark Lanier leaves one day? What happens if he leaves this church? What happens if he has to move to New York or L.A. or some other place, right? The question is, why are you following Jesus? Are you following him because Mark says you should? Or are you following him because you have a heart cultivated in worship to a God who has given so much to you? We have to be careful not to fashion ourselves after things that are not God, because worship is about acknowledging God as who he says he is and fashioning ourselves in light of who he says he is. Worship is acknowledging something as worthy of pursuing and fashioning ourselves after. Something we adore, give affection to, and praise to. We all worship something. As a Christian, our object of worship should be the Lord. Our worship is fueled by a knowledge of who he is. Here's how I like to 
define worship. And some of you maybe have heard me talk about this before. Worship for me is our joy expressed. Simply our joy expressed. We were created to find full satisfaction in the Lord. And then once we have been satisfied by him, turn that satisfaction and joy back to him in praise. Let me give you an illustration of how this works. Some of you may know that I have a passionate relationship with this drink called Dr. Pepper, right? And you've heard me talk about this before probably because I, I just like my one thing, you know, I don't eat a lot of sweets. I don't eat a lot of bad stuff. I don't try to eat fried food or fast food. Um, and so, but my one thing that I love that's kind of a vice and probably a pet vice for me is this Dr. Pepper because it's just 23 flavors of goodness, right? <laughs> Anybody testify, right? It's Texas made. We should be proud about it. It's from Texas. And so I just like drinking them, right? There's a product placement on Mark's website. I like Dr. Pepper. How did I hear about Dr. Pepper? Well, my mom loves Dr. Pepper. And so at growing up, my mom had Dr. Pepper in the house. And one day she said at a certain age, Jared, you should try Dr. Pepper. It's really good. And she gave me Dr. Pepper and it changed my life. It was a great drink, right? I had so much more energy for about two hours. Then I crashed. But after that, it was great. And the reality is that I learned about Dr. Pepper because somebody enjoyed Dr. Pepper and then told me about Dr. Pepper. I mean, the Trend continues, right? The goal is that as I enjoy Dr. Pepper and I tell you about Dr. Pepper, you get to enjoy the taste of Dr. Pepper and its goodness, right? And in a much greater way, we should do the same things with the Lord. We have been given so much, so much greater than a drink uh, by the Lord. And as we taste what the Lord has given us and we see that it is good, we should then communicate to others how he has satisfied us. And what greater way to give glory to God, if indeed that is why we were created, and I believe that it is, that we were created to glorify the Lord. The way that you and I glorify the Lord, making much of his name, is to be satisfied by him and then proclaim to him our joy in that satisfaction and tell others of the satisfaction that we have found in Christ so that they can in turn go to him and find that satisfaction, giving them, then him the same praise that we have given him. And that is the goal of all of creation. God is worthy of every single person that he's ever created from the beginning of time to the end, worship. And here's the incredible thing. Even if every single person that has ever existed worshiped him with every fiber of their being, it would not do him justice. That's how great and infinite our God is. And that's what worship is about. Being satisfied by him, turning that satisfaction back to him in joyous worship and then communicating that to other people. When mankind works like this, all of creation benefits. When we seek to glorify the Lord by proclaiming his singular ability to satisfy so others can taste and see. Today, we see a woman who is pursuing joy in the wrong places and Christ comes to satisfy this deep thirst for abundant joy. Turn with me to John chapter four. One of my favorite passages in all of scripture. Let's see, so a little bit. All right. Here's what the Bible says. What was that? Am I focused? Where's the focus button? Maybe. Is it, does it autofocus? No? Yeah? Let me try this. No, that's the wrong way. Right here? Right here. Oh, you're right. Absolutely right. Is that, is that focused? Can you all see that? Yeah? Okay. Or you could look in your own Bibles if you have those. Those are great to keep with you. All right, here's what we have. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar. Now, I'm going to move over a little bit and show you this little map, which is why I brought my big Bible today, not to bash you over the heads with it. Um, But you can see this little map right here of the 
the land that Jesus is moving in right now. At the top up here, you'll see Galilee. Down here, you'll see Judea. And these are uh, integral places in the Gospel of John, okay? And right between Galilee and Judea is a place called Samaria. We'll unfold that a little bit later, but understand that in order to get from one place to the other, you got to go through Samaria, okay? We all there? Here's what Jesus does. Uh, there we go. All right. So he came in town of Samaria called Sakar near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus was wearied um, from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. That's about noon, our time. Now, anybody ever been to the Holy Land? How hot is it at noon? It's hot, right? I mean, it's, a, it's heat, okay? Imagine the middle of a summer here in Houston, that kind of heat. People just don't walk around carrying large jugs of water at noon. This is the high point of the day. It's hot, Okay. It's important for us to recognize that there's something significant about the fact that this woman is coming to draw water from a well at the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away from the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and then our father uh, and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here and draw water. Now notice the transition that Jesus takes here and this segment of scripture. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. So talking about thirst, okay? Deep thirst, and how Christ has come as the living water. And then there's this unique transition that Jesus makes for this woman to go and call her husband. And they are connected. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. Now, generally we all jump into judgment right here. Because it sounds like she's a little bit of a floozy. But we don't know why. We don't know why this woman is... Uh, in such a tumultuous state regarding marriage, okay? We do know this is the reason why she's coming at the sixth hour because the women in her community likely are talking about her because she's had five husbands and is living with a six that's not her husband. We don't know if these husbands have died, if they have divorced her, um, and it could be that she is sleeping around. We just do not know the answer. What we do know is that time and time again, whenever she is hurt, she is turning again to another man to fulfill that hurt, the woman said to him, verse 19, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now notice again the transition that happens in this passage. They go from a conversation about water and the relationship between Jews and Samaritans to a conversation about the way this woman is living, then to a conversation of worship. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ, when he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. That is a powerful, powerful passage that we see in John chapter 4. And inherently what you need to see is that the entire passage is dealing with worship. Now to give a little more context to the incredible nature of the conversation that Jesus is having here, I want to give us a little more background. Uh, the first thing is, who are the Samaritans? Before we dive into that, let me just give you a, a brief overview of the significance of this conversation from a guy that's coming to visit us soon named Tom Wright or N.T. Wright. Anybody going to that lecture? 
Yeah? Okay. I am. And let me just encourage you guys. If you have not signed up for that lecture or you're not planning on going to that lecture, reconsider. Because N.T. Wright is one of the great scholars in Christianity today. And he has written some incredible, incredible things. Here's what he writes in this little uh, thing called John for Everyone, part one. It's a a commentary, but it's a very accessible commentary. So if you're looking for just an introduction to John, that would be very easy to wrap your head around. This commentary is a great one. So Tom, writing about uh, this particular section of the Gospel of John, gives us this um, overview about the significance of Christ's statements uh, to this woman. Number one, for a start, Jesus was known already as a holy man at this point, leading a movement to bring Israel back to God. John's readers know that he is more than that, but we must learn to think with the minds of his followers at the time. In that culture, many devout Jewish men would not have allowed themselves, and notice that, would not have allowed themselves to be alone with a woman. If it was unavoidable, they should be. They would certainly not have entered into the conversation with her. The risk they would have thought was too high, risk of impurity, risk of gossip, risk ultimately of being drawn into immorality. And yet Jesus is talking to this woman later in the chapter. John shows how startled the disciples were by this. Second, how are we doing here? The woman is, of course, a Samaritan. Ever since some of the Jewish exiles, we'll cover this in just a minute, had come back from Babylon to find that the central section of their ancient territory, which I showed you a minute ago, was occupied by a group who claimed to be the true descendants of Abraham and who opposed their return, there had been constant trouble. We'll get into this a little bit more, but when Ezra and Nehemiah are writing their things, there's constant attack on the rebuilding of Jerusalem from the Samaritan people. And we'll talk about why the Samaritan people were uh, hated, mostly because of their intermarriage. Uh, The Jewish people at that time who resettled with the people of Assyria who were coming in there, uh, there was an imperfection of the line from Abraham, and as a result, they were seen as half-breeds. And because of that, the Jewish people rejected them. Plus, with the stuff you see here from their attempt to destroy the rebuilding of the temple, there's great tension between the Jewish people and the Samaritan people. So much so, let me see. It's not in here. So much so that uh, Jews, when they were going from Judea to Galilee, literally would follow the the Jordan River Valley and add days to their journey just to not go through Samaria. And there's also some danger in Samaria, which I think we'll see in a minute. To find that the central section of territory, ancient territory, was occupied by a group who claimed to be the true descendants of Abraham and who opposed their return, there had been constant trouble. Sometimes it had broken down to actual skirmishes with bloodshed and murder, but mostly it was simply a matter of not mixing. The Jews wouldn't have anything to do with Samaritans. They would especially not share eating and drinking vessels with them, and yet Jesus is asking this woman for a drink. Third, compounding both of these problems... The woman is obviously a bad character. The normal time for a woman to visit the well, said it was from distance from the town, would be at a cooler time of the day, most likely first thing in the morning or late in the afternoon. This woman has come at the time when she is least likely to meet anyone, at least anyone who knows her, her past, or her immoral lifestyle. The significance then of Jesus talking to this woman is profound. Okay, let's dig a little bit deeper here. Who are the Samaritans? Turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 17. Some of you remember, of course, I used a timeline when last we were together. I brought the whole thing. There we go. Just to give you some perspective about where we are, um, let's see, 721, let me scoot out a little bit. Okay. 721 BCE is the fall of Israel at the hands of the Assyrians after Hosea rebelled under the false hope of support from a weakened Egyptian monarchy. Later in 588, 586 BCE, besieging of Jerusalem and subsequent fall at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar after Zedekiah's refusal to pay tribute. So we see here the the fall of both the northern and southern kingdoms, okay? So just a little bit of background as we jump into um, what we see here happening in 2 Kings chapter 17. 
And let's start over here with uh, verses 6 and 7 to give you some context. And the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria, captured Samaria, and he carried the Israelites away to Assyria and placed them in Halah and on the har- the Habor, the river of Gozan, and the cities of the Medes. And this occurred because the people of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who had feared other gods. Okay? So they feared other gods. And as a result, the Lord brought judgment upon them. Okay? So now we're going to jump back into verses 24 to 41 to kind of give you a little more context about the Samaritans themselves. Okay, maybe. It keeps moving. These big Bibles are harder to keep in place. Here we go. And the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and Severim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the people of Israel. And they took possession of Samaria and lived in its cities. And at the beginning of their dwelling there, they did not fear the Lord. Therefore, the Lord sent lions among them, which killed some of them. Now, aren't you thankful that we don't have that happen today? Some of you aren't believing in the Lord. Well, here come a bunch of lions. Let me help you with your belief a little bit, right? So the king of Assyria was told, The nations that you have carried away and placed in the cities of Samaria do not know the law of God and of the land. Therefore, yeah, he has sent lines among them, and behold, they are killing them because they do not know the law of, of the God of the land. And the king of Assyria commanded, send there one of the priests whom you carried away from there, and let, let him go and dwell there and teach them the law of the God of the land. So one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and lived in Bethel and taught them how they should fear the Lord, right? So you get the picture here. The king of Assyria hears all this stuff is happening because they're not fearing the Lord. So, hey, I'll just send one of these guys back from Israel to teach the, all these foreign peoples to love the God of the land. So here's what happens. Every nation still made gods of its own and put them in the shrines of the high places that the Samaritans had made. Every nation in the cities in which they lived. The men of Babylon made Sukkoth, Benoth, the men of Cuth made Negral, the men of so forth. Uh, so verse 33, this is the key right here. So they feared the Lord, but they also served their own gods after the manner of the nations from among whom they had been carried away. They feared the Lord, but they also served the idolatrous gods of their own nations. So you can see here that this intermarriage, intersettling of the people of the the land of God is causing worship of God to be mingled amongst God, other gods in the area who do not deserve the worship that God deserves. It reminds me of a situation I saw when I went to Brazil uh, early last year. We got to go down to a place called Porto Alegre. And what happened was when uh, the the, um, Portuguese, thank you, just lost it for a second. When the Portuguese came over and settled Brazil, they forced the inhabitants of Brazil to become Catholic. And because they forced it on them, the, the people in Brazil weren't necessarily at that time converted to Catholicism. All they did was simply give their local deities the names of Catholic saints. We call this syncretism. When... Christianity ideas are merged with other religions to form a a new religion of sorts. And so when we were down there with the missionaries, they were telling us that we have to be aware of this when we go and we proclaim Christ to people around us because they may say that they're Catholic, but their understanding of Catholicism is not the same understanding of Catholicism as rightly taught by the church. And so we go in there and there's this park in the middle of Porto Alegre. And there are rocks there, and in front of these rocks are all of these offerings. And in fact, in front of one of the rocks was a, a, a plate that had tons of baby stuff on there. And our guide told us that this plate was an offering to a dark spirit of someone who wanted harm to come to the children of another household in their area. And in the same park, there's a picture of St. Peter on one of the other boulders, and people are giving worship to him as well, okay? So it's not traditional Catholic teaching at all, 
but they're saying that they're Catholic. But what they've done is they've merged the worship of their own deities with the worship of, Christi- of the Christian God. You see that? And the same thing is happening here in 2 Kings. They're being told that they should fear the Lord because they don't want lions to devour them. Okay, we'll fear the Lord, but we're still going to honor the other gods we have. And my friends, that does not work. That is not the worship that God is due. And because of that, the Jewish people hated the Samaritan people because in their inherited, in their heritage, they saw a mixture of worshiping God and other gods. This is amplified in Nehemiah and Ezra when the people of God are returning, rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the walls, and a guy named Sanballat attacks them. This is from Mark's lesson. If you want to look on page two, we'll kind of just walk through this for a second. In Nehemiah, we shift several hundred years to the southern kingdom Jews returning from their Babylonian exile. One of them named Nehemiah had become a government official. The king allowed Nehemiah to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls of the city, a monumental moment in Judah's history. While Nehemiah and his team worked on the project, they met opposition from a group headed up by a Samaritan named Samballot. Samballot organized the Samaritan army to oppose Nehemiah and the Jews. We read this in a handful of verses, but this was, uh, this was real history. It lasted for some period of time. and was a course of antagonism that threatened the safety and existence of the Jewish nation. The Jewish historian Josephus gives some additional detail. Samballat was the governor or satrap of Samaria who at first sought to forge a good alliance with the returning Jews. Samballat gave his daughter in marriage to a Jew named Manasseh, brother to the high priest Jadua. Uh, Jid- Manasseh participated in the priestly duties. The elders in Jerusalem were concerned that Manasseh had intermarried with a non-Jew. They instructed him to either divorce his wife or cease serving as a priest. Sembalat, the Samaritan guy, had a better offer. Sembalat told his son, his son-in-law, to come north, and Sembalat built the altar at Metgerizim, setting up Manasseh as high priest. Many other priests left with Manasseh and began serving at Mount Gerizim among the Samaritans. Nehemiah does not name Manasseh, but simply states, Shall we then listen to you? and do all this great evil and act treacherously against our God by marrying foreign women. And one of the sons of Jehoiada, Jehoiada, okay, whatever that is, sometimes you get them on the first try and sometimes you don't, but I don't have time to wrestle with it. The son of Eliashib, there we go, the high priest, was the son-in-law of Sembalat the Horonite. Therefore I chased him from him. Remember them, O my God, because they have desecrated the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood of the Levites." This was one of many actions that engendered hard, further hard feelings between the two groups. So you can see there's a lot of water under this bridge between the Jewish people and the Samaritan people. So the fact that Jesus intentionally goes through Samaria when many of the Jews of that day do not do that, to go sit and talk with the Samaritan woman has profound implications about how we should view the future worship of the Lord. Jesus engages the Samaritan woman, and he speaks to her at the core of her struggle, at the core of her hurt, and offers to her living water. I don't want to spend a great time here because we have a lot to cover in a little bit amount of time, but I do want to draw your attention to Jeremiah chapter 2, where we see this idea of living water be brought out in the Old Testament. And this is a, a judgment passage from the prophet Jeremiah, and the Lord is declaring why he has brought judgment upon his people. And I want to look right here at verse 13, where he writes, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Here's what God is saying. I created this people, a covenant people, to be fully satisfied by me, to be protected by me, to be cultivated by me. And yet, continuously, time and time again, they look to other people to find other gods to meet the needs that I alone can meet. I have given them living water, and yet, They continue to go to these broken cisterns with dirty water to drink when I have given them 
water that will cause them to never thirst again. And Jesus is picking up on that imagery in John chapter 4 when he's dealing with this woman, the Samaritan woman who has engaged with broken cisterns. She has turned to men time and time and time again to fulfill the very basic needs that she has as a human being. And God is offering to the Samaritan woman, the enemy of the Jews, suggesting that now this offering that Jesus is giving us to worship God truly after being fully satisfied by him is available to all people. The Samaritan woman, the lowest of the low according to Jewish teaching of that day. If Jesus would go to a Samaritan woman, then there is nobody, there's nobody that he would not go to to offer the ability to be fully satisfied by him and worship God because God is worthy of every single person's worship. So in light of this, what is true worship? So we're going to spend the remainder of our time in Malachi, which we've already been in a little bit today if you were in worship this morning. Malachi chapter 1. Malachi is one of my favorite passages, or one of my favorite books in all the Bible. When I was in um, seminary, I got to translate Malachi from the Hebrew. And so that's why I have that timeline, because it's a Malachi timeline. But I want to give you a little more background in Malachi to help you understand what the people of God were doing and how they justified what they were doing. It's from a little paper I wrote, a little background to um, the book of Malachi. Everybody see that? We'll start here at the highlight. By the time the messenger of Malachi is writing, shortly after 433 B.C., the post-exilic period, which is the post-exile period, of the nation of Israel has begun. The post-exilic period, as I've already told you, is the period of time in which Israelites were permitted to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple and the walls of the city, ushering in Second Temple Judaism. Okay, so that's our general background of what's going on in Malachi. Now I'm going to get a little more specific. Ezra and Nehemiah have already come. Ezra is convicted to go back and to rebuild the walls. He comes back full of confidence and authority of Artaxerxes and began to enforce the Torah to purify God's chosen people. Let me give you a little more background here. Even though the Jewish nation, under the leadership of Zerubbabel the governor and Jeshua the priest, had finished rebuilding the temple, their actions and practices had not yet conformed to the holy standard of the law given to Moses. As a result, Artaxerxes I, in the seventh year of his reign, commissioned Ezra a scribe versed in the law of Moses to return to the trans-Euphrates and reinstitute the authority of the Jewish law. The Lord had been faithful to his promise and had blessed his people, allowing them to return to their promised land. The people then, in the eyes of Ezra, had a responsibility to again become his holy nation, walking faithfully in the covenant. So that's why Ezra returns here to address, firstly, the problem of mixed marriages, promulgating the law, prohibiting mixed marriages, and during... Uh, And during an official ceremony of the Nouveau Covenant, the men repudiated their foreign wives and sent away the children they had born. So he's attempting to purify the people of God to be worthy again of worshiping, okay? So now we come to Malachi. In this interim period between Nehemiah's first visit and his second in 430 BC, Malachi writes his prophetic word to the newly reformed Judean people. Ezra's institution had failed to procure permanent results. So Ezra comes back with a goal of purifying the people of God, and it lasted for a little while, but it did not last forever. The people of God revert back to their sinful ways. Further, the recent rules instituted by Nehemiah were not being enforced. The Jewish people were offering impure sacrifices to the Lord, failing to pay their tithe, and continuing to intermarry with women from other nations. The covenant people of God were blatantly betraying that covenant, failing to see that God still demanded them, excuse me, to obey my voice and keep my covenant if they desire to be his treasured possession among all peoples. More broadly now, the Palestine, the nearly 50,000 strong Hebrew remnant encountered was a diminished province occupying approximately less than half the former pre-exilic kingdom of Judah. Further, 
There was a strong resident alien population there that adulterated the purity desired by Ezra, Nehemiah, Malachi. Finally, the Persians were warring continuously with the Egyptians. And guess who's right in the middle? Jewish people. Making the Palestinian area politically unstable and economically strained as both the provincial governor and the Persian overlords taxed the new formed nation. Not surprising then, because of these poor economic times, the people of God became more pragmatic than faithful, intermarrying with resident alien population for wealth and neglecting the deprived and disadvantaged and reneging on their tithe. So here's what the people of God are saying. God, you brought us back into this land and it was good for a little while, but now the Persians and the Egyptians, they're fighting all the time. We're being taxed. We have no money. So here's what we're going to do, God. We're going to continue to give our, idol, our offerings to you. That's what we're supposed to do. But we're not going to give you our best. We're going to give you uh, the, the sheep that's blind. We're going to give you the sheep that has a broken leg. We're going to give you the calf that won't fetch the most money because you know and I know that I need this really good sheep and I need this really good calf in order to make a living. And surely, God, you would want us to be comfortable. You would want us to have money. And so we're not going to give you our best. We're going to give you what we can. Which is the background for what Pastor David even preached on this morning. So in one of my favorite verses of scripture, let me just show you guys how the Lord responds in Malachi chapter one. A convicting passage, no doubt. We're gonna look at verse one and then verses six to 14. Well, it's, just, it's simply the verse one is the oracle of the Lord of the, of, to Israel by Malachi. Here's what, the, here's what the Lord says. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests, who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? Now listen, that's a, a very lost generation of people right here. When they are doing things, they know do not honor the Lord, but they've explained them away in their heads so much they don't even recognize that it does not honor the Lord. How have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favors as the Lord of hosts? If you presented this to your governor, you could be dead. And now you entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us with such a gift from your hand. Will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, listen, this is incredible. Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. From the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name, and a pure offering for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted, and its fruit, that it that is its food, may be despised. But you say, what a weariness this is, and you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or is sick, and this you bring as your offering? Shall I accept that from your hands, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. That is is a proclamation of God's sovereignty, if yet yet ever I have heard one. So what is true worship then, in light of what we have seen in Malachi? How is it that the Lord wishes us to worship him in light of what we have seen in Malachi? True worship is not doing God a favor. Many of us come to church and we think that we are doing God a favor. And when we offer less than our best, when we give him the 
the blind sacrifice because we think it's all that we can give, when we give him and we honor him with things that are less than we should, we think we're doing him a favor because at least it's something. It could be worse. I could give him nothing. And here's how God responds to that kind of heart of a worshiper. I'd rather you stay home. Isn't that convicting to you? I would rather you not offer me anything. I would rather them shut the temple doors and not let any one of you in there to give me what you call worship than come in there and give me something that's half-hearted. Yikes. Why? Because we were created to glorify the Lord. Our worship is why we exist. As I said, God has given us love, uh, the need for love. He has given us the need for peace, the need for grace, the need for mercy. And the point is for us to turn to a God who is all of those things in their infinite and abundant form and find them be fully satisfied by him. And then as we find love and peace and grace and mercy in their perfect and infinite form, we turn that back to him in glorious worship giving him all that we have because he has given us all that he has. He has shown us so incredible love and abundance. How can we turn then back to him and not give him what it is that he deserves? When you and I offer less than what God deserves, we are communicating about how we value the Lord. When we turn to other things, as the woman in Samaria did to satisfy us, what we are inherently saying is, God, you are not good enough for me. I want to be loved. I want to find security. I want to find pleasure. I can't find those things in you. So I'm going to go to man after man after man after man to find those things. And I'll worship you. I know I'm supposed to worship you on this mountain. I know Messiah is coming. I'll give you what I can, but ultimately I want the touch of a man more than I want the touch of you. And what does God say to that? That's not worship. That's not finding joy and satisfaction in me. That's not honoring me the way that I'm supposed to be honored as your God. Malachi says, Shut the doors. Don't even come into my presence if that's all you have to offer. I want to challenge you guys this morning. True worship is about finding ultimate satisfaction in God and coming and returning that satisfaction back to him in joyous worship. Have you found true satisfaction in the Lord? Think of the significance for this woman when she is set free. cause her to never thirst again. Samaritan woman being offered the glory of God. Some questions for home for you. Number one, what are you worshiping? What are you fashioning yourself into? If it's true that we become what we worship, what are you fashioning yourself into? into? Who do you try to become like? What do you give your time and your energy to in order to achieve? What are you worshiping? Secondly, how are you offering yourself to the Lord? Paul takes this idea of sacrifice as worship to a new level in Romans 12, 1 and 2. You see it in your packet from Mark, where he says that our our act of worship now is to offer ourselves as spiritual sacrifices to the Lord. How are you offering yourself to the Lord? Are you coming to him half-hearted? Are you coming to him blind and lame? As a believer, if you're not a believer yet, you need to come to him in that way because he can put you back together again. But after you've given yourself to him, are you continually striving to be worthy of the calling of God upon your life, giving him your best because he's given you his best? Thirdly, do you truly believe that salvation is for everyone? And there 
Are there people that you would not associate with even for the gospel's sake? Jesus breaks down those barriers because God is worthy of every single person's worship, regardless of how they've offended you or hurt you. And then finally, what's your place of shame that Jesus needs to speak into? Because until you let him heal that and satisfy that hurt and need, you'll never be able to worship him the way that you were called to worship him. John chapter four is an incredible passage of scripture because Jesus is transforming our idea of worship and giving us a greater picture of what worship is. We are to be fully satisfied by this living water. And every single person, the covenant people of God, to the people that they hated the most, is worthy of this living water so they can taste and see that the Lord is good, that he can satisfy them in greater ways than anything else this world can offer us. And as we are satisfied by him, we should turn that satisfaction into worship, giving God our very best. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray you would take the words that you have shown us from your word today, that you would seal them up in our hearts and you would challenge us to worship you in greater ways, Father, by giving you our best even when it doesn't seem that we can. When circumstances around us challenge us, Father, may we remember that you are faithful, that you are sovereign over every single thing that happens to us. God, may we be challenged as we hear the the challenge from Pastor David this, this morning, even in the way that we give, knowing that you have challenged us to challenge you in that, that you will bless us in incredible ways when we are faithful to worship you as you have called us to worship you. God, we love you and we thank you in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen.